on stonework and stru structural problems. My name is John Gilbert uh, and I work with Annie Flint on underoneroof.scot. We'll be referring to that website. Uh, there's a lot of connections to it from what I'm going to say today. So if you want more information, go to the website. I would like to thank Safe Deposit Scotland for funding uh, these webinars. Thank you. Now today I'm going to be joined by two speakers. First of all, Fiona Sinclair, who is a Glasgow conservation architect. And then I'll have Robert Storey, who's a structural engineer. The things I'm going to talk about, first of all, is uh, basically stonework, uh, the types of stone, how they're, how they're built and pointing. And then I'm going to give a, a brief talk about structural history, really, the construction of tenements, how they were built, because I think it's important we understand that when if we're going to understand the structural problems we're faced with then I'll talk about the structural problems and we'll have question and answer sessions uh, which will be open to everybody uh, at the end if you look at a typical cross section of a wall the outer face is ashlar that's all you see basically but it, it's not very deep uh, maybe it's about a hundred millimeters and uh, every maybe third course would be bonded into the main wall which is behind it and that's built of rubble stone and in between the rubble and the outer face it's just full of chippings and lime mortar uh, sometimes brick chippings uh, and obviously the the plaster work inside is set on maybe lath and plaster uh, that's kept a wee bit uh, away from the wall what you have to make sure you allow the, the, the wall to dry out. Stonework has to breathe uh, and it ha the water has to evaporate. Uh, if it doesn't, if it's sealed in by cement pointing, then it can go inside and it, it will then soak any embedded timbers like safe lintels. So always remember that uh, the, the, the stonework has to dry out uh, and shouldn't get soaking wet uh, if possible. That's why the gutters uh, are very important and cornices to throw water off the face of the stone. Uh, this is just a, a rear elevation which is well pointed with stone coins um, and it's a coarsed uh, rubble stonework. Uh, if you look closely at a wall like this uh, you'll see the lime mortar uh, and it's got small uh, aggregate, small chips inside it. Uh, and that varies from uh, lime mortar to lime mortar, but it's basically a very breathable material. If you've got whinstone or granite, then that's a very dense stone, but it still should be lime pointed, even though it's hard. Ashlar usually is finished uh, with a very uh, white lime putty pointing. Uh, which is maybe two or three millimetres wide, but sometimes it's very tightly uh, jointed uh, and so so tight you, you wouldn't really want to point it uh, in this case, but it is well bedded, bedded in lime behind. This is a stonework where you can actually see the pointing and that's because this this sandstone was painted and someone's taken a sandblasting machine to it at some stage in the 70s probably and blasted the stonework so it's damaged the stonework and hard line pointing at the face of it is still visible. Otherwise cement pointing is usually quite easy to see and can be sometimes just peeled off because it's not bedded in very quickly, very well. This is a exaggerated problem of line pointing or sand cement on pointing. The trouble is if it holds the moisture into the stone the stone will get attacked by frost uh, if, it, if the moisture is held into the stone and obviously it, it doesn't allow the stone to move at all so cracking will be evident in in this lime in this uh, cement pointing so this is just an example of the decay of stonework after it has been cement pointed what we've done in the 1980s is applied cement repairs to the stone and then coated them with a linestone material which is a sort of resin and then sand is thrown at it. This has not lasted. It's, it's held the moisture in and that has caused no end of problem. Uh, really it has to be removed if, if at all possible and it's difficult to remove 
Uh, sometimes it just takes the front face of the stone with it. So you'll see this throughout uh, Glasgow where this linen stone is peeling away. Uh, sometimes you can get the finger behind it, but usually these are just cement patches which have been treated with linen stone. You can still do plastic stone repairs uh, using a lime-based repair medium like lithomech. It's not done on listed buildings or conservation areas or as little as possible, but you can get a, a good decent finish with it and it does still allow the stone work to breathe. Um, However, if it's done like this, you know, it looks a bit uh, plain uh, and they haven't got the the character of the stone because it's all the same colour. But here, it, here's the stone where it's been indented. So new stone is put into the wall and then lime pointed. And that's really how it, it, it should be. Indenting a stone uh, should be done carefully and usually with stones that are at least 150 millimetres thick. And sometimes they might to be dialed in with stainless steel dowels or or uh, cramps. Here is a repair on a building which uh, some of the stone indenting is only 50 mil thick and it's not tied into the uh, stone backing at all. Lintel repairs uh, often done with a bit of steel. This one's not galvanized but it's rather crude and actually it can be repaired much easier uh, by fitting in a uh, a stainless steel rod across the crack and uh, putting uh, jointing it in with resin. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward uh, operation. You can put rods in at the side of windows as well. It just depends what angle you can get. When you've got render, uh, the render is often cement render uh, and if it's removed uh, you'll find that the uh, stone underneath is just rough ru ru rubble. I mean that's why it's been rendered uh, and this one is what's behind that render. You can see the point, uh, the, the, the stonework actually needs pointed as well as re-rendered and that would be re-rendered in a lime mortar. And uh, this is a gable wall in Edinburgh and uh, you know it's suddenly fallen. It's probably a cement mortar and it just hasn't bonded to the backing or there's movement and moisture's got in behind. Uh, really this sort of thing it needs to allow the wall to breathe and that's why we try to use lime mortar. Now I'm going to ask uh, Fiona to join me. Okay Fiona. Hi John. <laughs> How important do you think uh, pointing is? Oh it's it's easily the most important aspect I mean there it's well I mean pointing of course was used for bedding as well as for finishing um, so it's the glue that holds everything together, but it's a breathable glue. Um, and it's remarkable how much moisture can be driven through a very fine joint that's lost its mortar. Mm -hmm. um, I particularly liked your description of how embedded timbers um, can get very, very wet. And of course, that leads to all sorts of issues with um, joy stains that are built into walls, lintels, but also uh, the dukes that were used to... Um, yeah. to Match the, the, the kind of lath and plaster construction that we see so much of on the inside face of historic buildings. And it's, um, it's the removal of those dukes that sometimes gets um, just kind of overlooked um, during kind of like repair and restoration projects. And uh, one tiny little duke with a little touch of dry rot can easily be reactivated. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's the it's the extent to which we see such a lot of wind-driven rain and um, your point about string courses and projecting ledges and sills and hood moulds and cornices, that's what we typically see up here in Scotland, all designed to sort of deflect as much rainwater as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously it's, it's important at bays and orioles where the walls are much thinner as well. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's, that's something that is sometimes really quite difficult to address because you've, you've not got the same thickness of, of inner rubble in a mm -hmm. bay window construction because, of course, bay windows, particularly oriel windows, which began at maybe first floor level, they, they're trying to reduce the the, the, the... the builders were attempting to reduce the weight 
of the cantilever, the construction that was being held up by perhaps some corbelled uh, stonework or by a bit of cast iron. So it was all about kind of reducing the weight. And, and as a result, the stone, as you say, is far thinner. I mean, if, if your tenement is, has been repointed in cement, what, what would you advise owners to do? Well, ideally, um, you know, if, if there are funds, it really ought to be repointed in lime. But uh, there comes a point where a, a, there has to be a value judgment made on is that cement mortar uh, damaging the stonework? Um, and how difficult is it going to be to remove? Will it create further damage? Uh, typically, it becomes problematic when the cement mortar, as you showed in one of your illustrations, uh, is proud of the stonework because you've mm -hmm. created a little ledge for rainwater to sit yeah. on. And as you mentioned, it then freezes. Um, if the cement mortar has been recessed or is flush, it's it's less likely to be problematic and it may be more difficult to remove. Mm. Um, a great deal depends on, well, how well it has been done and how badly it's affecting the the stonework and typically yes on a rear elevation where rubble um, is used or uncoursed stone is used um, instead of polished ashlar that's where you typically see the decay setting up quite dramatically um, because much broader cement pointing um, you know will have been used yes uh, so you're more likely to find issues on the, the kind of rear facade of a, of a, of a building. Well, if you've got linostone, how easy is that to remove? Usually removes itself. <laughs> you can, you can, uh, the, the thing about linostone is it's been such a long time since we've used it that any building that has linostone on it is likely to be maybe 20, 30 years since it was it was applied. Um, and, and it's relatively apparent um a good way of actually a problem that we we identified relatively early during the the 1980s uh early 90s when we were using it is sandstone changes color when it wets so it darkens um whereas linostone doesn't and uh, you know if you look at a a building after you know, some wind-driven rain has has actually, you know, kind of soaked the facade. You can relatively quickly identify those parts that have been repaired using what you, you called plastic repairs. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can actually see the extent of something like linostone or, or similar products. Um, I think now we see those sorts of products began to fail some time ago and they, they, they are not difficult to remove. But then once they're removed... Um, there are issues of how do you repair the stone. Much more difficult is paint on a building. Uh -huh. uh, it's harder to remove. Well, we, we're getting wetter weather. What areas of the wall are at most risk? Uh, those at low level. Um, there's a lot of damage caused to stonework uh, by water splashing up off hard surfaces, off pavements, if the building's hard onto the pavement. Uh, you typically find uh, there's rising damp as well, which 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 causes decay. Um, we don't use the same sort of de-icing salts that we used to, but they caused quite a bit of damage uh, when when they were being splashed up off the road or they'd been applied to pavements. Um, and of course, uh, at high level, uh, you typically find anywhere where water can sit and takes a long time to dry off. Um, facades that face the north that might not dry out quite as quickly as those facing south, they're, they're the ones that are likely to be at risk. And of course, anywhere a joint has opened up and plant growth has begun, um, you know, that, that just exacerbates the whole problem with stone decay. I mean, we haven't talked about damper of coursing, but I mean, have you, do you find that most tenements have a damp proof course or can you find the damp proof course? Yeah, you, usually um, slate was a wonderful material to use and very, very effective. And it can still be found, in, you know, if for whatever reason a wall has to be dismantled um, for, a, for a slapping, a doorway, for instance, you typically find the slate damp proof course. But over a period of time, uh, buildings are hard onto the pavement. The pavements are kind of, uh, they're increased in height. One application of tarmac 
paving slabs or whatever, and inevitably the ground level rises up above the damp proof course. But and what the building sinks. <laughs> and the building, the bit, well, hopefully the building doesn't sink. But what you also find is that um, things like rewiring and central heating, if that's installed and accidentally the damp proof course on an internal wall I'm talking the damp proof course um, is interrupted it, then that breaks the the kind of line of defense um, and then it's far more difficult to um, to kind of reinstate that defense against rising water. why why is it so much so important to get a, a matching stone when you're doing an indent well interestingly it's um you know nature's all about sort of something sacrificing itself. I was just thinking this morning about galvanizing of steel and how the zinc sacrifices itself to protect, you know, the the the, the, the steel, the iron. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same with stone. You find that some stones are far softer and uh, more porous than others. And if they are matched or incorrectly matched, I should say, uh, to a much, much harder stone, then that harder, the water will run off that harder stone and it will accelerate the decay of the softer stone. Uh, so I think what needs to be understood is there's a very wide range of stones used across Scotland. Granite, as you mentioned, uh, we sometimes uh, see buildings that have brick detailing um, but on otherwise stone facades. And if you find um, two different types of stone used one next to the other, and one is far harder than the other, then you will begin to see decay in the, the softer of the two. So it's really, really important that as close a match as possible can be found. Because it's remarkable how two different types of stone that are the same colour behave in quite different, um, mm -hmm. different ways. Uh, so the, the same thing applies to matching uh, the lime mortar as well. Oh, absolutely, yes. And it's about finding... Um, inevitably what you find um, certainly out of the big cities you find that the, the aggregate used in the lime mortar would have been local um, yeah. looking to, to, to get something that is, a, that is a good similar match but also sometimes in, you know it's wonderful looking at buildings that are close to kind of coastal regions you sometimes find shells and all sorts of things in the aggregate and it's quite important to get the granular sizes the same um, that doesn't apply to the same extent on polished ashlar facades, which are typically just pointed in line with a with a bit of sort of linseed oil. But on rear elevations, the joints were relatively large and had to be filled. And um, the, the way in which to fill them was to, to kind of vary the size of the aggregate. And um, it, it's important that the right type and size of aggregate is used because it allows the lime mortar to cure properly. You can't use too much lime mortar um, in too large a joint and expect it to cure unless the aggregate is the right size and the right type. Well, well, thank you very much, Fiona. That was very interesting. You, you'll join us at the end of the webinar for the question and answer session, I hope. I will, yes. Yeah, good. Okay, I'll see you then. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, just a little bit about how tenements uh, got to be built. It used to be uh, in the 17th century uh, about 15 stories high in Edinburgh, so it was very dense. Um, obviously, uh, there were problems with that. Uh, we have still got some 10 story tenements in Edinburgh, but in 1698 um, there was a fire in Edinburgh and uh, they then decided to reduce the height of the tenements to five stories. Um, there were other collapses. In 1861, there was a big tenement collapse uh, and killing 35 people. Uh, and actually, the main change came about after the 1824 uh, fire in Edinburgh, which spread from one tenement to the next tenement. Uh, and it was ag agreed then that uh, the cause of that was the timbers that were embedded in the wall, in the party walls. So they outlawed that, and so as a result, the joists go front to back now, uh, and that was for Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, how tenements were built is essentially without scaffolding, and that's what's uh, interesting, uh, because they were built, uh, uh, this one is in Partick, you can see the uh, about 20 labourers on site on top of the uh, second floor um, platform uh, with no scaffolding um, and they were, were built like this um, 
uh, as the uh, uh, overhand basically as the floors were built up um, and this is a section of how it would do how it would happen you, you would build the foundations first of all and that would go up to the first floor uh, you would put in the ground floor and then raise the partitions which were usually uh, in the form of H frames at the doors and this would uh, provide a mid support for these long joists which would span front to back and as the joists were put in the floors uh, were were used as platforms and the walls could be built up and up and up to the roof uh, and eventually the roof was built uh, all without scaffolding uh, when that was finished uh, the internal walls were infilled with brick um, so in fact it, the the infill the brick infill probably happened as it went on uh, at the same time but uh, it does uh, provide uh, a, a risk now these are the joists that go into the outer wall and obviously if that outer wall is damp they can uh, get uh, soaking wet and rot can uh, occur the same goes for the uh, safe lintels above a window uh, just here um, they're quite vulnerable to to rot outbreaks now the door frames are usually H frames which are used to support uh, timber sort of timber trimmers to support the the joists mid span uh, it's quite an interesting feature and you can still see it above here um, this is the H frame that goes up now you see the brick is in between these stud partitions so it's discontinuous uh, so you sometimes get cracking at these points now I'm not going to talk any more about how tenements were built but I'm going to talk about problems in uh, structural problems uh, here's an example of a shop that was added later with a steel beam underneath uh, and the joists actually look like they're a bit decayed so maybe that cornice has uh, collapsed because of that uh, or maybe the uh, steel joists have been put in and it hasn't been supported while it's been put in. You can also see uh, the chimney uh, void has opened up because the bridges have fallen because they're very poor, poor tie in there. Um, this happens a lot of the times at sh shop fronts which have been changed or added later. However, you do get uh, rotten joists at the first floor where it gets very damp um, on the ground floor and you sometimes get bulges as the, the weight of the wall falls down and pushes outwards. Uh, at the top floor, if the rafters are rotten, then that may lead to uh, a flattening of the roof so the ridge will go down and that will push out the outer walls um, and here's an example in, in Govan Hill of a collapse which caused by rotten roof timbers. Uh, you also get it uh, if you look carefully on the left hand side you can see a slight bulge in uh, an, a bay here uh, and actually maybe you can see it uh, a bit more clearly on the right hand side uh, and this led to a collapse um, of the bay and everybody had to be moved out uh, I think only now after three years uh, is something being done about that it, because they had to take the whole front elevation down uh, it's a shame really um, why did it happen well uh, yeah uh, you can see if you look closely the ends of these uh, floor joists are rotten and they provide the tying action between the floor plate and the outer wall uh, and if these become rotten that tying action disappears so uh, you have to be very careful to make sure that uh, the timbers are dry and timbers uh, joists are not rotten so uh, here you can see inside uh, you can check uh, safe lintels uh, by boring uh, but sometimes it's very difficult to see hidden rot uh, area in outer walls um, chimneys are more easier to see but usually something like this uh, with no uh, ladder stay uh, is quite risky 
Um, so it could collapse and uh, injure people. Uh, this is in a way what happened at, in uh, Balliol Street in Glasgow where uh, poor or uh, previous work had not been done very satisfactorily and uh, the gutter was widened and probably there wasn't a, a decent overflow as well uh, and it led to the collapse of the parapet which then brought down the cornice um, and this is just a bad sketch uh, that I did uh, to show what had happened because the t front parapet had been pushed out by heavy rain and that had brought down the uh, the cornice. Uh, basically nobody, w nobody was killed but it, it was a problem. This is a another common problem where you don't have enough bonding stones in the outer wall uh, tied into the the inner wall uh, usually, you know, you should have it maybe every third third course there would be bonding stones which go a lot deeper. Um, here they're only maybe 100 mil if that. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, and here a crack in a lintel. Very common, but this is caused by scaffolders uh, putting bolts into the lintel and then the lintel cracking. So this is just caused by uh, poor uh, builder work. Uh, we get a lot of problems with Orioles in Glasgow. Um, in fact, you'd think it was an infection of Oriole problems. Um, and really, you know, why do we get that? It's it's the tying in of these Orioles. Sometimes it's very badly done, and it it's because maybe this cast iron plate that is embedded in the stone is beginning to rust and you can see the blue piece of uh, metal there is the cast iron tie-in beam and then there's the timber bresimer which you find at bays and lintels uh, sorry bays and uh, orioles um, which are embedded in the wall uh, cast iron plate bresimer beam this is the sort of thing that uh, you would expect rot inside because they're so open jointed this is the Bressemer beam at a bay. It's bedded into the outer wall, so it, it is vulnerable to rot. Uh, and really, if it is rotten, probably the only option is to replace it with a steel beam. Um, you can do resin repairs sometimes, but uh, sometimes the rot is, is just too deep. Um, the other problem with bays and orioles is the jointing of the lintels. They're tied together with staples, steel staples, or maybe they're phosphor bronze, but they ro have rusted over time. So this is an example of one uh, where it throws off a stone and here is what the, the, the corroded uh, staple looks like. And you can see how it's cracked this stone mullion that uh, would, was holding it all together. Up near at the cornice, uh, at the top here you can see another staple, it's rusted and again thrown off the, the stonework. Um, in the close you often get cracks in the corner of the close down. This is maybe accentuated in this photograph. Uh, it's not always as bad as that but you will get often uh, hairline cracks in the close. Um, and really that's because of differential movement between the outer walls and the inner walls which are much lighter. Um, and also the fact that the inner walls are usually in brick and the outer walls are in stone and rarely are they tied together. So the, the brick is maybe bonded in, if you're lucky, every fourth course, rarely uh, even that. So uh, there's always a risk of cracking at these points. And this is more dangerous really where you've got a crack at the corner of a close... Uh, I mean there's there's been a, a steel angle uh, plate put in to stiffen this wall structure before uh, up above the window there um, but there's still a movement crack uh, which is continuing on that outer wall and on the left hand side this is just a big building but you'll get diagonal cracking this will be differential movement uh, below the building at, at the foundation level so it might be ground movement maybe because of trees or moisture in the ground 
and again differential movement of lintel here uh, so you know usually it's quite easy to tell the differential types of movement uh, cracks and here uh, on my left hand side you can see the crack in a lintel uh, which goes all the way up but actually the whole building has been moving uh, you might have to pin this and tie it together and um, you can't really rebuild the foundations now this is a fire obviously uh, and it just shows you that if the fire burns up all the timber floors uh, then the outer walls don't have any support and they'll come down as well uh, but at least it hasn't spread to the neighboring tenements but you know it could so easily have done and this is why we have the skew walls the party walls that go up about a foot above the f the, the, the ridge uh, sorry the uh, slated roof or the tiled roof and uh, it's important to keep these party walls now this is a photograph which Robert gave me and I'm going to hand you over to Robert because he's going to explain what it is because I don't know. <laughs> Robert, are you there? Well, that is a, that is one a, a Wilson block type construction where it has the, the blocks that are connected together with a, a tie and the ties are corroded. Right. So it's, what, what it's done is just pushed the individual block face out. So you're getting you know, uh, just like you would see in brickwork, actually, but you're seeing it more pronounced in the block, where the, 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 the tie has expanded due to the corrosion right. and it's pushing the front face out. So you're seeing that uh, ripple effect in the front, uh, what is effectively just the front veneer of the building. So yeah. you, there's not much you can do about that, but rebuild? I mean, you could have to rebuild. Can you rebuild the outer face or do you have to take the whole thing down and rebuild it? Yeah, you, you know, the... I, I personally wasn't involved in that one. I know that we've been involved in a four-storey Wilson Block construction where we've had to take the Wilson Block away. So you have to replace it with a load-bearing masonry, usually on the internal face to prop the floor and then remove the Wilson Block and completely remove the Wilson Block elements. So God. yeah, it's, it's quite, a lot, quite a lot of work. What, what you do on a small scale like that, I'm not really sure. I know that we what we have done in the past where, where we think the corrosion is not as severe is that they were protected it to just give it an extended life expectancy, but it's not it's not a solution really. You know, it's a, it just extends, you know, the, the useful usefulness of the building. But it, yeah, replacing the Wilson block elements are the only thing you can do really there. Yeah. A lot of work involved. To go back to the Victorian style of tenement, I mean, what do you think are the main problems in tenements? Structural yeah, uh, I think the video highlighted a number of the ones that we see. Uh, cracking of all sorts is obviously uh, is, is the thing that engineers get called out to look at the most. And we're not so um, worried about a size and length of a crack. It's, it's usually the cause is, is, is the main concern. So the video highlighted where you get uh, cracks between different wall constructions or you get cracking internally around the H frames. That's quite common. And sometimes these cracks can be quite significant, but they're not that worrying because we know that, you know, it's the natural construction of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you can get quite fine cracking, but it's, it, but, but, but it's due to a, a water ingress that's caused a lintel to crack that can then lead to a greater, a bigger problem. So cracking of all sorts is probably one of the main things. Bulging, you, 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 you showed in the video, but gable bulges are probably a, a big problem with tenant, te tenements. Exposed gables, uh, particularly between two tenements, where you get a funneling effect of the wind. So that tends to suck on the, the walls and you get this bulging of the gables. And that's why you see a lot of tenements with horizontal steel straps in them. Um, staircases particularly, I know Oreo windows, I agree, are a, a big um, problem in Glasgow, but so are pen, pen check staircases, stairs, and can be more dangerous in, in, in a lot of respects because the sudden collapse of these is, is, a, a, is always a, a potential issue. So get called out quite a bit to look at open treads and staircases, and we have to be careful with those when we look at them. Uh, um, and there's been a lot of work done to tenements. You see a lot of repair works to, to yes. staircases uh, because there was a, a time, and I think late 60s, early 70s maybe, when there was noticeable, uh, there was 
he, he collapses in it. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the council took on responsibility to do these repairs. But um, in Glasgow, we always have to be wary about ground conditions and undermining. So when we do see external cracking, then and it's severely uh, goes down to ground level, then we do see a lot of uh, problems related to ground uh, mining situations, yes. uh, and that and those are severe as well. You know. Well, okay. on on that question, do you think that increased wet weather will actually uh, lead to an increase of movement of the ground and therefore subsidence? I uh, I've not come across that particular issue. I mean, um, a lot of um, west the West Coast soils are, are clay, you yeah. know, they're heavy clays at that. So the, 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 we don't usually see uh, a, an immediate response to, to, to wet weather. I mean, there would be an, a, an issue if a, a, if a tenement foundation was being flooded regularly. Um, I, I suspect you, you would see an issue, you would see a problem with potential settlement. But uh, it's not, you know, unless that was the case. In other words, the flooding was noticeably deep externally. I don't, I, I, I can't see the wet weather having a direct effect on foundations. Or no, I suppose it would be more risk of dry weather and drying out the clay. And then... Well, that can happen. That can happen. But generally speaking, the soils, uh, if, we, if we're talking about Glasgow, but we don't necessarily have to talk about Glasgow, but general, generally the soils uh, are stiff clays that, that perform mm -hmm. quite, quite well. And, and that's why probably tenements have, uh, you know, performed reasonably well. They, clays will consolidate and, and settle over time. So naturally, these, these buildings, which are extremely heavy, will slowly uh, settle over decades. And that's why you see cracks appear in buildings, even though they've been up for a long, long time. It's because the building is continually moving, you know, slightly, slowly, but it will continue to move over its mm -hmm. lifetime. Yeah. And why why do you think we have such a problem with Orioles in Glasgow? Well, I wondered that. I mean, the, is it just Glasgow? I know that, there's, that we have a lot more Oriole windows. We have a lot more concentration of tenements in Glasgow. And I wonder, statistically, is it such a problem? But we certainly do have a big problem. And uh, not just with Oriole windows, but uh, uh, I would say bay windows as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things... Um, uh, you're correct to say that the floors span front to back, therefore all the weight, if you like, from the floors goes on to the, 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 the front and rear exter external elevations, so the walls are very heavily loaded up. Uh, round about an audio window or even a bay window, you have the, the load, if you like, is taken off the external stonework round the window because you have the Bressemer beam, but mm -hmm. the floors go on to the Bressemer beam. So actually, you know, the front part of the audio is very lightly loaded, yeah, and also, it's it's quite a light construction in comparison to the rest of the wall. Where yes. so, so the mass, the, the normal tenement wall, won't easily be sucked out by wind forces. Um, but an audio window will, you know, because it's 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 relatively light, so it's yeah. more susceptible to to be sucked out, and it doesn't have so much timber weight onto it. So any kind of moisture that allows the timber to rot or get in in the construction of the, of the wall will allow the audio to move. Yeah, that's a point because the the bays and oriel walls are much thinner. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're not two feet thick. They're only at, at the most uh, mm -hmm. a yeah. and so moisture can get through if it's not pointed up properly. Moisture can get through at that point and possibly cause rot as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, water ingress. I say lack of maintenance is one of the biggest issues you'll you'll have with tenement. A defects causing tenement defects, water ingressing either from the roof due to poor guttering repairs, a, through joint work in the stonework, through bad pointing, even through windows that are a, not maintained properly. So even around a bay window, an oriel window, you'll get water ingress around the edge of the window. As I say, if it comes down, as we know that the, the construction of the wall is effectively a, a relatively thin veneer of good stonework. Behind that, there's the ash fill and water can tr trickle down to the floor level. So allowing water into the construction really is is, is, the, is, is the thing we have to try and prevent. So good maintenance you know, is a good way to prevent it. What risks are there from parapets and cornice gutters? 
Yeah, well, they, if they're not properly maintained, will allow water to stand and, and build up behind the, uh, the, 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 the parapet. So you, uh, so you get this, you know, a potential for water to come in to the roof construction, I think, over the flashing, even at, at the roof side. Uh, so, so there's that issue of just making sure those, those, those are cleaned, well cleaned, and they're exposed as well. You know, you have this yeah. um, from the top, you know, the, the weathering directly on top of the parapet itself. So, so again, it's a case of keeping the stonework well maintained at these levels. Yeah, the high cool. levels are it's important. Yeah, exposed on both sides of the parapet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robert, that's been pretty interesting, and thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll join us uh, at the end for the question and answer session, uh, sure. where I'm sure there'll be a few things you'll need to answer as well. Uh, okay. okay, we'll leave it like that. See you later. See you again. I oh, just need Robert here. <laughs> so, uh, well, while Robert is waiting, Fiona, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Fiona, of all the defects you saw here with, today in my presentation, which ones are, are likely to cause most trouble? <laughs> oh, where to start? Well, yeah. no, no defect is, <laughs> is a good feature of a building. Um, yeah, I mean, Robert is better placed than I to talk about structural defects, but you were talking at the tail end of your conversation about water ingress. I mean, we need water to live and we use huge quantities of water in traditional building construction, but we at the same time really need to control the amount of water that, you know, our buildings are exposed to. And um, you were talking about uh, maintenance of gutters and rainwater pipes. The um, difficulty that we with, um, with gutters and rainwater pipes is they're Sorry, you're breaking up, Fiona. Is that better? That's better, yeah. Yeah. OK, so in respect of, uh, of water ingress, it's just incredibly important to actually shed water from a building um, as swiftly as possible. Um, and to also uh, to look out for aspects of rainwater goods um, that might not be immediately obvious. So for this is a leaking gutter joint. Now, a leaking gutter joint, you, you know, you might think that that's not going to cause a great deal of damage. But there is a there's a building not far from my office, the tenement. And um, the continual run of water uh, from a single leaking gutter joint over a period of time worked its way behind the stonework at a much lower level. And then finally, a great sort of, you know, kind of layer of stone was shed, um, you know, from the face of the building and kind of landed on the ground. And, you know, l luckily it was attended to very, very swiftly. Um, but just that constant run of, of water had actually caused the sort of unexpected damage, but also rainwater pipe, uh, cast iron rainwater pipes, the seam is usually on the back of the pipes. And if they're mm -hmm. not maintained, if they're not decorated regularly, and if they're not painted around the back, the seam can crack and you can get water running down the back of the pipe and, and leaking through into the stonework and the pointing. So it's really all about, um, it's about monitoring the, uh, the, the condition of the various parts of the building that work together to to remove water as swiftly as possible. And that continues on into drains because if the drains are blocked, then obviously the rainwater goods um, you know, can't get rid of the water swiftly enough. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think, uh, yeah, sorry I couldn't join you a bit earlier. Uh, definitely the, the majority of problems that I come across are uh, probably related to water ingress into the structure in some form, whether that gets I would even say a uh, window maintenance is an issue. Um, a, so even get water getting in behind the window frame, which can seep into the actual uh, centre of the wall. I'm not sure if you guys are getting a bit of feedback, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. If you, I don't know if you're hearing this clearly, but that's 
that you know watering this has got to be um, you, you know uh, uh, you know controlled as much as possible. Good maintenance, uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah, don't let any external uh, sealant, if you like, whether that be guttering um, or, or mastic on windows. That's all got to be kept in good order if you want to maintain the, the quality of the uh, or you want to the condition of the building. Absolutely. Okay, so what's the best piece of preventative maintenance uh, that a stair association can do? Reg regular inspections. Uh, regular inspections and uh, have a good maintenance program. And that's, we'll start with just uh, cleaning of gutters, you know, never mind repairing of them, but just cleaning of them. So, mm -hmm. so up to, you really need to get up to the high level often. Um, uh, so, uh, Inspection, so you pick up problems early, whether it's a burst pipe, whether it's rotting windows, whether it's a damaged gutter, um, a loose slates, things like that that may not seem uh, huge, uh, you know, uh, big implications when, when you spot them, but can lead to bigger problems. Up, uh, so, so these have got to be picked up as early as possible. Uh, after a storm, the building Keep, keep an eye out for, for things that may have uh, uh, been damaged during a storm, like the uh, slates coming off the building, get these replaced immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, you know. So you uh, you would inspect a stonework how frequently? Well, I would say every five years for a good inspection. Uh, you know, to have a competent person inspect. So uh, that doesn't have to be a structural engineer. Generally, structural inspections tend to be targeted inspections when there's a problem that's come up. That's usually when I get involved. But you but it, it, you can do a structural survey, but more a more general survey because you want a survey of more than just the stonework. You want a building surveyor or any other competent person. It doesn't have to, to be someone particularly uh, with a particular uh, niche expertise, if you like, someone that's used to doing that to vote, to look out for the issues. If you see any issues, then you can report that you can get maybe the experts involved if you like. Every five years would be my recommendation. Okay. Well, actually, we should go on to the question and answers before. Well, I can come back to questions if we run out of questions. Uh, we've got one from Angela. Hi, Angela. Uh, if a property becomes uninhabitable due to collapse, who is responsible for finding? Uh, emergency accommodation for the tenant. I would have thought that the council probably because the, the person would be homeless, but uh, you know, otherwise, anybody else like to take me up on this? Um, well, a great deal depends on whether the building has a block insurance policy or not. Um, what's interesting is that projects that are currently being funded by Glasgow City Council's Building Repairs Grant Scheme. It's a requirement that once the work's been completed, collective owners take out a block insurance policy. And I think if you've got a block insurance policy, then that possibly be with your, yeah. would be your first port of call in the event of decant accommodation being required. I think it's much, much more difficult if everybody is individually insured. Um, so uh, there's lots of good guidance on the Under One Roof website, of course, about this. But I think this is something that... Um, is being recognised as the importance of a, of a good block insurance policy um, that covers all these sorts of things. Right. Yeah, I think that's that's good advice. So block insurance policy or, or failing that, the council, I think. Um, there's one there from Alistair. What is the main cause of spalling on the stonework? Yeah, well, I can have a go at that. I mean, the, the obvious one is uh, frost attacking a uh, weak stonework. Um, so the you know just generally over a period of time, uh, stone. Well, what happened in a lot of tenements is that you know that we, we usually naturally assume they're good quality of construction, but they're not actually sometimes and can be quite poorly constructed. Stonework wasn't always orientated the right, correct way. So sandstone, for instance, should always be laid, the bed should be horizontal. Sometimes it's laid vertical. And what you get in, in that situation is water get, get behind the beds of the sandstone, and that can spall out. And it might take, let's say, decades before that can happen. So that kind of a, a long-term erosion of the stone, if you like, can, can be one of the main causes. 
poor repairs. You mentioned in your uh, video, John, about the uh, linostone repairs. You, so yeah, that could be could be maybe perceived as being the stone that's spalling, and then erosion of the joints. So you get the face of the, uh, the stone being eroded. So they're, they're probably the main causes, not the only causes, because movement can cause a, a stone to spall as well as it gets dislodged due to the movement. But uh, I would probably say, again, water ingress seems to be a common theme in our, our pitch here. But that seems to, uh, that's probably the, you know, the, the main reason that I've come across. Fiona, anything? Some sandstones are far softer than others, so a great deal depends on the quality of the original quarry. Um, it, you know, when sandstone is wetted, particularly if the water's driven into the kind of body of the stone, it sets up a, uh, you know, it sets up a chemical reaction, essentially, and all the kind of constituent parts of the stone, you know, begin to, to, to sort of slightly alter. And what you sometimes find is that a, a sort of protective crust is formed in the face of the stone. Um, and of course, when Glasgow was far more polluted than it is now, that manifested itself in a, a, that very black crust that we would see on buildings. Um, you know, and acid rain, of course, uh, was a contributor to that as well. And you find that um, that crust sometimes loses um, contact with the kind of body of the stone behind and, and falls off. But frequently you find that the stone behind can be polished um, and, and, you know, sort of tidied up to, to prevent further deterioration. Um, you know, that's in extreme cases, of course. But yeah, we, we keep talking about water ingress and that's essentially what it's about. So you typically see uh, worse deterioration on buildings that face southwest because that's where the wind driven rain comes from. And I would say that anything facing southwest requires just that tiny bit of, you know, added kind of care uh, when carrying out an inspection. Okay, thanks. Um, can you get a block insurance policy if a factor is not in place? Well, I, I would have thought so. You probably need a stair association, a formal uh, body, uh, before you can uh, have a, a common insurance policy. But I think it's quite possible without a factor. Uh, I think you'd probably refer to other pages on our website uh, under management. Uh, I really deal with just the technical side of things. Um, Barbara has asked, uh, how do you monitor yourself if a crack, uh, how do you monitor yourself if a crack is widening? Is there a technique? Well, there's different monitoring techniques. And Robert, you can answer this one. Uh, dare I say I would discourage trying to, to, to go too far with the monitoring uh, yourself. If, you if you're concerned about a crack and it's progressing, then really get someone who knows a bit about it to have a look. Um, you can obviously mark, you know, with a, you know, if you see a hairline crack internally, you can mark it with a pencil or whatever and, and see if it moves through a period of time. Sometimes, I, I, now I get this more often than, than people maybe uh, think, is that uh, people notice cracks that have been there for years. Uh, you know, they, they suddenly notice cracks. That you, 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 and it can happen because... Uh, Something's happened that, uh, that's brought their attention to it. Maybe you know a neighbour's done some alteration work, or has been neighbouring construction work, or something along those lines, and uh, and suddenly you, you you become aware of a crack that you weren't aware of before, and it becomes a concern. So so yes, and that, you know so sometimes it might be worth just doing a wee mark on the wall and and, and seeing is it something maybe that's uh, it has been there for a while and, it, and it's actually not really an issue. But certainly if you're noticing any movement, engineers are particularly more concerned about movement rather than the size of a crack. You know, and that's that's the thing. You know, that you know, so if, if there's any a continual movement in a property, that's the thing that worries us more than something that's probably been static for a while. So yes, any recent cracking, I would probably say get a look at it. But sometimes it well, a lot of the times, uh, uh, certainly a majority of cases that I go out to, it leads to, to nothing. You know, there's, 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 there's usually a, a quite a simple reason why it's, the cracking's are cut. You know? Okay. Um, well, actually, I'll ask a few questions. There's the bulges in gables um, that, Robert, you mentioned, the suction effect of wind, but obviously gables are prone to this because the flues that go up gables 
maybe provide poor tie-in action. And also they don't have floor joists going into them. So there's no tie-in action from the floors. Um, yeah. You know, mm. it's always just the wind, the suction of the wind. Well, that's that's the thing, you, you know, Gables, uh, if you think why, you know, with Gables, you know, what function they, they, they provide in a building, a gable is a mass wall that provides stability to the building. The features, if you like, the, the holes in the building tend to be front and back. So the gable is the mass wall that kind of holds it together. And so, the, you know, so generally because they don't have a lot of um, openings in them, windows, then, uh, then they are quite stable, you know, even though they're not tied back. Um, but, like, like you know, if they are, if, if the, the situations that, that generally lead to bulges and gable walls are, again, water. You know, that's one of the first things. This funneling effect that I mentioned, but also a lot of gables may have not necessarily been built as gables. Some people just assume that the gable end was always a gable. But actually, in a lot of cases, it's been a, 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 a there was an old terrace there that continued. The buildings were removed. And what you're seeing actually is part of an old party wall, which was never really designed to be a gable. Mm -hmm. so, so there's these kind of reasons that the reason why a, a bulges will occur. Um, so, yeah, but you know, the, the, again, bulges are not uncommon in, in, in buildings of this type. So provided you're getting an assessment for some for someone as experienced, who who you know will will expect to see certain types of movement in buildings of this site. You don't get concerned with every crack and every mo bit of movement. You have to put it in perspective of the type of building it is. And so the, the, there can be a lot of movement uh, in a gable, for instance, without it being dangerous. Yeah, so, so sometimes you may notice things that uh, you might be concerned about, but probably not a lot to worry about. So, thanks for reassuring me. Let me try put that in perspective, you know. Um, mm. I, I want to say something. We, we we do have a handout for this, and I, I think Petra hasn't, or I haven't, I haven't managed to put it onto the website, but I'm sure Petra will email it to everyone after this um because i think we've all got your email so um i hope petra will do that um finally just on stone landings in closes um they're often bedded onto timber can this be a problem that's robert yes. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in this or yes. sport <laughs> <laughs> uh, stone landings are a problem you know, they, they, they do, uh, you know, we've had to replace a number of landings because of rotten timbers or just movement in the, in the stair and the landings don't actually accommodate that movement very easily. So, the, uh, yeah, they can be a problem. Um, uh, so uh, you can't discount rotting of timbers and stone landings, uh, you know, but they, uh, I, I actually, uh, I probably see wrought iron used more than timber. I don't know if Fiona has, has found that, but that's, uh, you know, you can Yeah, I think la later tenements used yeah. to put iron, but there were some timber beams in the mm. um, landings. And close floors and the ground floor, you know, those large stone flags usually span right across between the close walls. And, mm. you know, if they crack, there's I don't think there's any other intermediate support to them. Is that right? Uh, yeah, you, you can get stone flags that span the distance. That's right. You also do get ones that have intermediate supports uh, sure. in terms of the, they'll have, again, wrought iron bars, uh, angle exceptions. Uh, but no, they, they, they do quite commonly span across, um, depending where the crack is. You know, if it's going across the, uh, the, the close, you know, across the, the width of the close, there's not usually much to be concerned about. It's only if the cracking goes longitudinally that you would be more concerned about it. Okay, well, I think we'll finish up there. There's no more questions. Uh, just uh, just uh, advise everybody to make sure you've got your gutters clean because it's the focusing of water in areas that causes the most damage wherever it's coming from. Uh, and that saturates the wall at one point, and that will rot timber inside, which leads to further damage. And get your building checked out once every five years at least uh, is, is a good advice. Uh, okay, and I think that's all for today's webinar. Good day, everyone. Uh, good day. All right. Thanks, John.